Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. It's a special one-hour debate for the 17th City Council District in the Bronx, a district that includes the South Bronx neighborhoods of Hunts Point, Melrose, Longwood, and Mott Haven. The council seat had been held by Maria Del Carmen Arroyo, but she resigned. And so on Tuesday, February 23rd, there will be a special election for voters to select her successor. There are six candidates running in this contest, and you will meet them in a moment. I do want to interject. The moderator has had a bout with laryngitis, so we're all going to do the best we can tonight. My apologies to the candidates and to our viewers. Tonight's debate is co-sponsored with the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. It also works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. We are thrilled to have them on board with us. Now, let us meet the candidates. Seated just to my left from the Community First Party, the District Manager of Community Board 2, Rafael Salamanca, Jr. Good evening, sir. Thank you, from the Bronx Not For Sale Party, a businessman and political activist, Julio Pabon. Good evening, sir. Thank you. From the Bronx For All Party, a software developer, George Alvarez. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. From the Bronx Renewal Party, a member of Community Board 3 and founding member of the Bronx Volunteer Coalition, Marlon Molina. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. And uh, from the Bronx Rebuild, excuse me, from the Rebuilding Our BX Party, an associate minister of the Greater Universal Baptist Church in Melrose, Reverend J. Lauren Russell. Good evening, sir. Good evening. And from the Strong Together Party, the chief of staff of the outgoing council member, Joanne Otero. Thank you for joining us. Candidates in tonight's debate, I will direct a question to one candidate. That candidate will respond, and then we will have a free-flowing dialogue that each candidate can participate in, with the original respondent having the final say on the question before the next question is asked. At the end of the program, each candidate will be given the opportunity to deliver a one-minute closing statement. Please note that tonight's questions include those submitted by the candidates themselves, as well as leftover constituent questions from the recent Nos Quedamos Candidates Forum. By prior agreement, the first question will be directed to Mr. Salamanca. Sir, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Mr. Salamanca, you are undoubtedly proud of the lengthy list of endorsements you have received from the Bronx County Democratic Organization, uh, numerous elected officials, the borough president uh, just the other day, the UFT, DC 37, and more. But in a district that has been fighting poverty, fighting for environmental justice, and is in many cases dissatisfied with the status quo, does this come with an establishment tag that is not helpful to you in your campaign? Well, first, uh, thank you for, for having me here today. Uh, you know, uh, Gary, I, um, I've been district manager for the last five and a half years. I've lived in this community my entire life. I'm raising my family here. And um, it's, uh, I have an invested interest in the work that's done in the city council uh, for this community. Um, throughout my time as district manager, I've been very successful in getting rid of negative businesses in the Hunts Point community. I've been successful in bringing in uh, a, a new bus line uh, to Hunts Point. I am also the uh, president of 401 Precinct Council. And uh, as president of Precinct Council, I've, be, I've been successful in bridging that gap between community and police relations. Um, what I've done is move the meetings around, kind of bring the police uh, to, to the uh, community. I received these endorsements because of the results that I brought into the community. And as a city council member, I will continue to bring those results and be a stronger advocate in City Hall. Okay. Others want to respond? Everybody? Mr. Pabon, sure. 
I think you just raised the right point, and I think that that is the, the central issue here. The central issue here is it the different name, same game? Is it the situation that for the last 50 years that I've been in the Bronx, I haven't seen the changes that I think that this borough deserves. The fact is that this borough is in dire straits. It has some serious issues. We have one of the highest unemployment rates in the entire country. We have some of the worst health rates in the entire state of New York, 62 out of 62. So though I, I think that you know my friend here, because he is my friend, he's my friend on Facebook, uh, he, he, uh, he's doing a great job as, as a district manager, uh, but it's not he who, have, who I have issues with. It's the fact that the people who endorse him are the same individuals that have been part of a Game of Thrones in the Bronx. Others? Yes, um, I want to echo what he said. So the, this is a special election, yet the Bronx County has been heavily involved in suppressing some of the other candidates. And by doing so, they suppress the choices that people have. You know, I think Pavon and, and another candidate that's not here, not here with us warned us that at the next debate, there were going to be less people. And, you know, uh, my petitions were initially challenged by Bronx County. And, you know, if you're trying to get the community to participate, but there's a legal tricks that they play to kind of suppress the candidates. By doing so, they're suppressing the choices that people have. And you know what I say to the voters is, do you want county, <coughs> excuse me, county attorneys and, and his campaign deciding who you can vote for, or do you want to make a choice for yourself? And that's something that the voters should consider because he does have considerable resources, and you know, good for him. But the tactics is th what I have an issue with because this is supposed to be for the community. It's supposed to be a special election and there are some unfair advantages that are being leveraged. Okay, we'll give you a chance to do the final word, Ms. Otero. No, I just, I just <coughs> want to uh, not chime in or, or, you know, or repeat what has been said, but I've been asked several times, you know, do you have any endorsements? And I don't have any heavy endorsements, and what I've always said is that I think that the most important endorsement that we can have is community. And I, I'm sure everyone here is going to agree with that, that at the end of the day, people, no matter what endorsements people will have, it's the community people that are going to make a choice. And that's, that's key and that's important, and we have to keep that in mind. Okay. Others? Well, we'll sure, I'll go ahead. Something. Sir Alvarez? Um, I congratulate my, my opponent because he has those endorsements, but the reality is, for so many years, our community are facing the same issues over, over and over. And guess what? Who is on the power all the time? It's the same crew. It's the same team who is pushing him for this election. Now, if we go to the city statistic, we see that while the city unemployment is going down, this district is going up. We have double our unemployment rate within the district than in the city. In shelters, we are number one in the whole Bronx. So all the people that come in from other, from other districts are getting into our district. If, they, if we are getting the things that other districts are doesn't want, why are we not getting the results? that those other districts are having. Mm -hmm. I guess you're the last one. I guess I'm the last one. Sure, I need to say something. Huh? Um, the only <coughs> thing, really, um, I look at the endorsements and other things like that, but the critical piece for me, the people. It's the people. Um, these are not statistics. People are not statistics. People are real. People have issues. They're ongoing and they're continuous. And what we have to do is we have to make sure that we are addressing the issues that exist with the people in the community. That, for me, is the most important mm -hmm. thing, whether it's Salamanca, whether it's Otero, whether it's Russell Alvarez, uh, Pavone, or whether it's, it's, it's Molina. We have to make sure that it's really about the people. Mr. Salamanca, you have the final word. Thank you. You know, I, I received these endorsements not because I was friends with anyone. I received these endorsements because the results that I've put in. And if any of my competitors or any of the candidates here would have lived in my community, would have lived in Hunts Point and Longwood community, they would see those results. You know, you living in Hunts Point, dealing with prostitution, and being able to eliminate that, that's a big accomplishment. You living in Hunts Point, you don't have access to the other side of the district, and we bring in a bus line, that's a big accomplishment. You living in Hunts Point and having an issue with the police department, and we bring in the police department to the community, that's an accomplishment. So I'm happy of the endorsements that I received because it comes to show that I've worked hard for what I've done. Mr. Babon, you get the next question. It's kind of a flip side of what uh, I just asked uh, Mr. Salamanca. In this campaign, you've cast yourself as an alternative, to, and you've just uh, mentioned it, to the political status quo. While that may well have appealed to advocates, 
difficult reality is to get things done, to get any of your ideas or bills through the legislature, you need to build friends and coalitions. Would the public be better served by, for want of a better word, an establishment candidate, one with a broader base of support? Well, being an established candidate and not being able to produce results that we are still suffering from in the South Bronx, particularly in that district, which continues to be one of the poorest in the city and in the state, and in some indicators as, as bad as in the country, uh, doesn't mean anything. I think that what we do need is an outsider. We need someone that can bring in new ideas, fresh ideas, and in terms of coalition building, in the 1970s, when very few blacks and Latinos were able to get into the construction industry, I came in with a program called Recruitment and Training Program, and as a result of that program, we were able to go and work directly with the trade unions that were very difficult to bring in blacks and Latinos, and as a result, we placed thousands, thousands of blacks and Latinos into the Trade Building Council, where today they have enjoyed mm -hmm. uh, pensions and great salaries. In the 1980s, when a Job Corps program, the first one in the country that was in the inner city, was brought to the South Bronx, there was a lot of sabotaging taking place, and it wasn't going to get built. I came in as a consultant, and I found out that the saboteurs were a gang called the Savage Skulls, who were being paid mm -hmm. by members of the county organization who were angry because they didn't get the contract. I was able to negotiate this gang and get them to be the first students. And right now, the issues that I've been working on with the EAU unit, that the people did not want it, but the EAU unit was going to get built. We were able to coalesce, and I was able to negotiate with the Commissioner of Homeless Services this issue where we all together. I did that without being paid. I was not working for any organization in the, in the government. I did that as an individual. Thank you very much. Others want to respond? Ms. Otero? I, I also want, I want to respond. I think that, yes, uh, you know, you said this, a candidate with establishment support. I think whether or not you have establishment support, I think we all have to agree that once we're, if we're elected, whoever is elected has to remember that regardless if you had that support of that establishment, that's an establishment you will have to work with. And I look forward to working with that establishment. Um, on all levels of government, it takes everybody to come together on any issue in the community to be able to bring real solutions. Okay. Anybody else? Sure, Mr. Molina. So I always maintain that, you know, I, by trade I'm a community organizer and <clears throat> what you learn as a community organizer, excuse me, <clears throat> is that sometimes you don't have a lot of resources, but there are folks who manage resources, whether it's the city's tax base, the city's resources. And as an organizer, I learned to hold elected officials and city agencies accountable for the services that they deliver to the community. So I'm very comfortable in that role, although I'm not the established uh, candidate. Um, I do come from a grassroots background, and I understand how the city works. I understand how the budget process works. And that's an experience that I will bring as a, as a, as a city council representative. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Salamanca, and then you, Mr. Bosa. You know, I, I have an invest. I, as I mentioned before, I live in this community. And whoever the next council member is going to be, they're going to represent me. They're going to represent my community, and they're going to represent my, my children, you know, and that's, that's dearest to me. Uh, you know, going into city council, what the voters want is they want someone who's going to bring results. They don't want an, uh, an, uh, an, ide an ideologist. You know, they want true results. They want to make sure that you go to city hall and you bring the f your fair share of resources to the community. And that's something that I will bring uh, to the 17th council district. Thank you very much. Mr. Babone, you get the final word. There's going to be an elevator finally put in 149th Street in the Grand Concourse. You know why? Because three years ago, I began a campaign with Ostos Community College to get pressure. It was finally put on the budget. That there was a condition there. There was no elevators in a subway that has like 86 steps going down. There has been issues that I've been worked up with Discovery for Justice. My son was arrested on a bogus charge. I didn't take it just laying down. We started an organization called Discovery for Justice, where we're trying to change the legislation in New York State to allow district, attor district attorneys to provide evidence at time of arraignment. So I have been productive because you can work in being productive with legislators that I've worked with, but at the same time, what we're bringing is we bring in a new change. There has to be a change from the status quo. Mr. Alvarez, the next question for you. The decision to put a fresh direct facility in the South Bronx with, was fraught with significant controversy and disagreement, yet it appears to be on the way to happening. Were you a supporter or opponent of this project? Moreover, is this a good way to spend public dollars and build South Bronx job growth? If not, how do you build South Bronx job growth? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think that the um, uh, uh, development of the district cannot stop. All right, so uh, anything that can be um, productive for, for the district 
we have to lock it, but we need to make sure that that doesn't damage our community. Uh, right now, with the Fresh Direct uh, contract, we are getting 100 trucks every day into our community. But the question is, why we don't just get a piece also of that things that Fresh Direct provide to the people outside of the district that we can afford? So. Mm -hmm. Completely agree to bring more jobs, completely agree to bring more uh, company into the district, but we need to make sure that that doesn't damage our community. Thank you very much. Others? Uh, Mr. Russell? Well, yeah, you skipped over your last question. I want you to know that Could you missed me. But I'm, I'm going right to address, in, let, me address let me address the, the first direct question. Um, the, the, the idea that we're bringing in new businesses in the community is a fine thing. We need new businesses. However, we need to make sure that the issues that plague our community are not exacerbated. In other words, the asthma and the breathing conditions, we have to make sure that the trucks that come into that new facility and all of the other facilities that's in Hunts Point are now have to provide the same type of emissions that they provide on buses so that our people are not damaged because we're bringing in more economic development or um, economic improvement. We cannot compromise the health of the people for the benefit of the few. In other words, money can't compromise health because people with money and have no health will spend all of their money to get it. So I'm not interested in building that kind of an economy. I want to make sure that our economy is built on the, the livelihoods and the benefit of people. So the people's health has to be a housed at a higher accountability. So yes, I'd like to see Fresh Direct, but I also want to hold them accountable to make sure that whoever does business with them is also um, doing what's right for our community by providing trucks and others to come there, make sure that they're equipped so that they don't emit those, those kinds of poisonous fumes. Okay, others? Uh, first Mr. Babon, then you Ms. Otero. Uh, ag again, this is another example of business as usual. You know, I think that the, our, our, uh, our uh, political leaders mean well when they hear of, of a situ situation like Fresh Direct bringing in X amount of jobs. But we've also promised X amount of jobs in one of the biggest construction projects in the city, which was Yankee Stadium. And there was a lot of, almost all the same elected officials that support my friend here are the same individuals that signed on to that contract. And I ask anybody who lives in the district, like I do also, how many of those jobs we got. When Fresh Direct wanted to come here, I agree. No one looked at the benefits of a community, but also they came in, they bring in jobs, but no one questioned about these trucks. But more importantly than the trucks, the fact is that they, they, they use a, a, a community study that's about 20 years old. If, if, if you're a leader in this community, you should have been asking, why not bring it up to date? You know how many houses, how many construction jobs have been brought in in terms of new housing in that area? Mm -hmm. That wasn't taken into account. And the health of a community cannot be un un you know, underestimated for jobs, never. Thank you very much. Mr. Salamanca, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, uh, I just want to uh, touch base on what Mr. Pavon mentioned in terms of Yankee Stadium. You know, I, I, I find it ironic that he brings up Yankee Stadium. Uh, yet when the community was against Yankee Stadium moving into the new field, uh, Mr. Pabon partnered with them. He actually was paid by them to work with the Yankees in terms of uh, trying to convince the community, uh, in, in terms of con trying to convince the community to moving in. So I just find it odd that he would bring in a Yankee Stadium and, you know, the community was up in arms because they were not getting a, a, a proper community benefit package that they thought that would benefit them. Okay. You certainly can respond. Absolutely. Well, definitely. There's a, there's a big difference. I was the one that was able to bring in the community to talk about those issues, but unfortunately, the contract that they had had already been signed. And what we were able to do, we were able to get uh, funds for uh, body, uh, for uh, Pregones, uh, Ostos Community College, uh, the Bronx Council on the Arts, Bronx Museum, ask any one of them what we were able to bring in because I was a consultant to them, which was different from a contract that was arranged by the county organization, which happens to be the attorney for county, and then now he's also a consultant. Why didn't you bring that one up? Okay. Um, Mr. Alvarez, you get the final word. Well, uh, basically, um, like they mentioned, I mean, we cannot compromise uh, our uh, people health because of the money that we're bringing. I have two kids, and both of them suffering for asthma. Uh, on the first day, I wasn't able to attend because I was at the hospital with my, with my son. And uh, we have to make sure that the same regulation that the city has for the buses is the same regulation that we have to implement for those trucks that are coming in here. But uh, um, I completely agree with the new business coming into the district. We need to um, uh, improve our district in, in that sense, but we cannot compromise our people health. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Molina. The debate over displacement and gentrification is a central issue for many Bronx communities, and with development targeted for the 17th Council District, it is a growing concern for residents and businesses alike. Is gentrification a necessary evil, or can you grow the 17th Council District, provide development opportunity and jobs, and do it in a way that does not displace even some of the people who have lived and worked in the district for years? So <clears throat> I used to sit on the executive board for the Mid-Bronx Desperados. You know, we manage 44 buildings, senior special housing. And the, the, the mix that brought the Bronx from where it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago where there were vacant buildings, um, you know, fake windows to show that, so just to hide the fact that it was a burnt out building. Those community organizations, when they approach development, they approached it in a way where they would provide um, supportive services for the, for, the, for the community that was moving into those buildings. And that's something that Mid Bronx has done. That's something that uh, Mount Hope Housing Company has done, which I used to work for the Mount Hope organization, which founded the Mount Hope Housing Company. So that's something I understand very well. So what I would do if elected to city council, I would like to see those community organizations get support so they can continue to rehab the housing stock that they rebuilt 20 years, 30 years ago. And as far as the new developers that are coming in, that were not coming in 20, 30 years ago, they wouldn't touch the Bronx. And it was the community organizations that decided to fight to you know, buy those buildings from the city, get the funding so that they can go ahead and rebuild the housing stock. Now that the housing stock is, has been rebuilt and you, know, you have a few choice properties, you have these uh, private developers coming in with private money and it's hard for them to compete. So what I would like to mm -hmm. do is I wanna make sure that those community organizations, those community development corporations like SEPCO continue to be a player in the way that the, that, that, that the housing stock continues to rebuild affordable housing. Thank you. Others? Mr. Russell? One of the things that you didn't mention in my, in my opening, in my bio, you, you mentioned I was a part of the Good, Greater Universal Baptist Church, but also a part of Goodwill Baptist Church, and also do development. I'm, I, I run a business, which is uh, the JLR company. We do loans. We do loans to churches, and we help them to develop their property. And one of the things that we focus on, to make sure that we focus on, is when property is being developed, that there are community-based organizations that's working in conjunction with these developers who's coming into our communities. Because if there's no grassroots involvement, then they can do whatever they want. Gentrification is a necessary evil. It's going to happen. People are moving out of the suburbs. They're moving into the inner cities. Where we happen to live is a great place for people to live. We're right next to every subway station. We can get to Midtown in no time at all, no parking fees. It's the place that people want to be. It's going to happen. But if we don't have a plan when they come, then a plan will be provided to us that does not include us. That's what's not acceptable. So we need to make sure that what we're doing is, is having a plan that involves the community-based organizations in such a way that the people of the community benefit from all of the development, not mm -hmm. some of it, but all of it. Um, Mr. Salamanca, then you, Ms. Otero, and then you, Mr. Pabon. Uh, Go ahead. You know, our voters also need to understand uh, that the next council member who is going to go to the 17th Council District is going to vote on a, a very important piece of legislation, which is mandatory inclusionary housing, where the mayor is, what the mayor is proposing in terms of the AMIs, I feel that is unacceptable. As a city council member, I will propose that we lower the 60% the, the AMI, which is the lowest on the mayor's plan, uh, to 30%. But we also need mixed income. We need to understand that we have professionals that live in our community, and they too should have access to these new developments. Ms. Otero? The, the gentrification of the, of the neighborhoods is going to happen, but it shouldn't be at the expense of those who stood here. The low and middle income housing uh, apartments that are available right now are not affordable to the individuals who are living in them. And it's really key, whoever gets elected, that we continue to work with small organizations that have, uh, have, can go into these developments and they can continue to work in organizing people who are being driven out because the owner, managers, want them to go out so that then there's the availability so that they can then, you know, have, have them at market rate. So that's why we, it's very key for, for that to be a, a priority for whoever gets elected. I think Mr. Babone was next and Mr. Alvarez. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, and, uh, this is one of the areas that, you know, my colleague here and I agree on. The fact is that I, I, I totally disagree with the mayor's plan, but I think that the mandatory aspect and to make it permanent, I th those are the two parts that I like. Every other part of that plan is definitely crazy because of the fact that the average income in our district 
<laughs> it's, it's like $20,000, $22,000. The average way to get one of those apartments or to deal with his AMI is about $36,000. That, is, that, that, that pulls out a whole bunch of people from our district. If you make $15 an hour, that's $30,000 a year. You still won't qualify to get an apartment supposedly affordable. There is no such thing mm -hmm. as affordability because that was never discussed with the individual areas of our community, and that's one of the areas that we're suffering from. So I agree with the borough president on that as well. We disagree with that plan. Uh, uh, Mr. Alvarez? Well, I think that all are agree here that that's going to happen. However, the question is here, um, are the voters ready to accept that? Are the traditional politician, the elected official that have been there for so many years supporting part of our, uh, our crew here, um, supporting our voters, the people who, who live in the community? That's, that's the question right here. Mm -hmm. I think it's not. I think that we have to make sure that our people who live in the district and want to stay in the district are part of that gentrification. Mr. Molina, you have the final word on that subject. Um, it, you know, they're right. You know, money will be invested in the Bronx, and we do need to make sure that we have a strong community input when all of these come, all of these developers come before the community board for, for, for a letter of recommendation. And it's also important to know that the community board, um, you know, they're, the, they're sort of like the gatekeepers of, of when development happens in the community. I sit on community board three and I've seen many developers come in promising jobs and, and promising to, to, to do well by the community, but there needs to be more accountability. You know, once they go before the community board, you know, they usually go back and, and, and uh, you know, they go back to, the, to whoever the elected official is. So they, there should be some accountability by how the elected officials represent their community in the final negotiation of these deals. Reverend Russell, the council is now considering the Cr Criminal Justice Reform Act. Proposals to decriminalize low-level crimes like public urination, littering, excessive noise, and the like. If you are elected, do you support the idea of easing the clutter in our courts and disproportionate enforcement of these crimes, but at the same time, essentially ending the so-called broken windows theory of fighting crime that had been credited with helping keep the numbers of more serious crimes down? I, I would definitely agree that we needed to get rid of those crimes, those petty crimes that create a systematic way of creating a record, criminal record for many people who live in our district. Um, the problem that we've been facing so long, for so long, is that th there has been a accumulation of, of crimes, if you will, that started with petty misdemeanors, such as marijuana smoking or urinating in the street that resulted in later on charges being elevated to felonies. And so we've got a proliferation of people who live in our communities who have felony convictions that essentially separates them and isolates them and takes them out of the, out of the, uh, the ability to contribute to society. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. And so we have a number of people now who are looking at and have served large, la long-term uh, sentences because it started out with a very small thing that could have been a violation. Well, let me just add the second part of the question was, uh, are you sad about losing the broken windows concept? Because essentially that's what is being traded here. Well, when you say the broken window concept, are you Meaning that if you, to, like, if you stop heavily prosecute low-level crimes, pr the, the uh, theory is that you would then be stopping larger crimes from happening. I don't agree with that. I grew up in the South Bronx. I grew up in, a, in the South Bronx when everything was going crazy. Um, I don't agree that when you prosecute low-level crimes <clears throat> to an extreme that you prevent something later on. I think that a lot of those low-level crimes are not being um, done by people who are, quote-unquote, perpetual criminals. They're being done by young people who really don't know any better. We used to call it being mischievous. Now it's called a criminal offense. So that's a problem because the, 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 the ones who are being arrested are, are younger people which creates a problem as they get older, which takes them out of being productive members of society. Criminal justice reform, go ahead. Yeah, it, I think that, again, this is another issue of the status quo. The, the, they, the bottom line is that jails have become a feeding process for keeping people in jail because it's now a business. If you, don't, if you have a business and you don't have the product, then you're not making money. These jails have been privatized. The fact of the, the way that the uh, criminal justice system is set up, when a young man jumps over a turnstile or a young man gets picked up for smoking a, a, a marijuana, they get a disc appearance ticket. But if you get two disc appearance tickets and you get picked up for something else that might be incorrect, even though you're innocent, you might be going to, to jail. And you might be going there for three years if you don't have bail like the young man who committed suicide mm -hmm. when he came out. 
So mm -hmm. th those programs definitely need to be stopped. Ms. Otero, then Mr. Salamanca, go ahead. And I, I just want to add that I think that what we, we need to make an investment in is more programs, more alternatives to incarceration programs, especially for our young people, because that is who, are, those are the ones that are com com you know, committing those, those low-level crimes. And then, you know, they're, they're there, and then it just becomes a cycle of they come out, and, you know, they come out, and then they have to kind of start all over again, and sometimes they don't, they're don't they not given those opportunities to them to be able to get on the right path. Okay. Uh, I think Mr. Salomon can yeah. go um, Yesterday I went to the, uh, the Speaker State of the uh, City, um, and I was extremely happy to see that there is going to be reforms in terms of eliminating uh, these uh, individuals that have low-level uh, crimes for the last 10 years. I was astonished to see, to hear that someone that has a warrant for 10 years ago uh, for jumping the term style is still following them in the track record and is preventing them from employment or getting apartments. And when I go to city council, I look forward to working with the council on passing that law. Um, Mr. Alvarez. And yeah, Mr. Um, and, and completely agree with that. I think that um, nobody born bad or delinquent. It's a matter of opportunity, and we have to provide the opportunity to those youth that live within the district. So with that, we can prevent them to be a part of the society. We need to create programs and law that will be able to reinsert them into the society once they make a, a, a high crime. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes, Molina, would, and, and then we'll let you wrap it up. I would go even further. Um, I would suggest that we change the policy of police officers being in the schools and the way that they treat young people. Um, something that would normally be handled by a school administrator. Now you have the law enforcement getting involved and then these young people, you know, they come out and they have, like he said, a prior record. So that is something that I would even suggest that we go further. You have the final word, sir. One of the things that I've been doing, I'm the clergy liaison for the 4-2 in the Bronx. And one of the things that I did uh, propose to the entire borough was to create an alternative to incarceration program. We sat down with the borough commander and his staff, and, and we talked about how we could do that, involving the judicial system and others, because if we don't begin to address the things that create the problems in the first place, we are going to lose, not only do we lose our children, but we lose the source of our community. That's not acceptable, and so um, we need to make some changes, and we need to do it at the root cause of it, so we're not just superficially glossing over things, but we're really dealing with the problems as they exist and where they exist. Great. For our uh, hardworking crew, I will tell you that we'll ask one more question and then we'll take a break. Um, Ms. Otero, let's talk about public housing. In plain language, NYCH is a mess. Crime in the city has gone down, but it's gone up in public housing. Mold, broken elevators, leaks, bad plumbing, reports of no gas and no heat for extended periods of time, and on and on and on. It appears to be a housing system that is not a system at all, but a total disaster. What can an individual council member do to improve the city's public housing stock? Well, as a, as a former public housing resident, um, and I've been working with for the last couple of years with the tenant association leadership, yes, some of the issues that um, I remember um, when I was there 15 years ago are still um, taking place. As a city council member, I would uh, continue to work with the administration to address issues um, around public, uh, around, around the, the cameras, the need for the safety. Uh, the, you know, we have to come up with an innovative way um, to come up with more money uh, for these public housing um, developments. One idea that was suggested was the administration is always saying um, in the authority that they don't have enough money. Uh, there's so many public housing developments and one strategy could be uh, to get funding into these developments is to put uh, solar panels um, on, on, on the developments. You know, there's enough footprint and then there, that would be a way to produce some revenue so that we can address those problems in, in the developments, not just with cameras, you know, but with other issues. Thank you. Uh, others, Mr. Salamanca? So Gary, as I've been campaigning, I've been door knocking. That's, that's actually the favorite part of this campaign for me. And uh, door knocking and going into these NYCHA developments, my heart goes out to see the conditions that these buildings are in. Elevators not working, where there's 14 stories. Um, leak, bathrooms leaking. Uh, just this week, I went to a, a, so an 82-year-old's bathroom, and the wall was basically gone. What she had was the, conc uh, the, the bricks from the outside that was there. We immediately called NYCHA. Uh, they're still working on it. 
as a city council member, I will work with my council member, Richie Torres, who is the chair of the Public Housing Committee, and ensure that we go to every housing unit that we have in the district, see what the issues are, sit down with NYCHA, and NYCHA needs to open up the books. I think that NYCHA has, has been mismanaging the money, and, and that is that has been mismanaging the funds, and that is something that I will address as a city council member. Mr. Bubbo. Yeah, I think that, you know, going to the NYCHA projects to collect petitions or to knock on doors because you want to get elected is one thing, but to go to NYCHA projects because you have family and friends who are constantly there and you have uh, parties or you have events there, which I have gone to recently. I also went to uh, NYCHA projects the day after the shooting. I was the only one that was there. I spoke to the people. I'm, tr I'm bringing in some professionals because they totally forgot about the people who witnessed this and there is no healing for that, for that community. I've also been dealing, yesterday I was in a PSA meeting with most of the other NYCHA presidents. The fact is that two weeks ago, there was a press conference where the, the chairman of NYCHA was there in the South Bronx, in our district. No, uh, nobody else was there. I was there and I spoke to her and I told her, when I get elected, I'm gonna meet with her that first week because I wanna talk about the problems of NYCHA because it's one thing to have press conferences and have all the TV cameras there, but it's another thing to follow up because when you go there consistently, not to collect petitions or not to secure a vote, because you have family and friends that live there. Mr. Alvarez? I just heard a couple of colleagues saying that they will continue working with the uh, current administration, but I in reality, do you think that uh, working with the current administration is going to change something? I mean, we've been dealing with this for so, so many years. We need to do something different. Which and is? And it made me wondering right now, I mean, the projects in the Nobel District, outside of, the, of, the, of these other problems, are they suffering the same thing that we're suffering here on the 17th? Mm -hmm. Mr. Molina, Mr. Russell, and then Ms. Otero. All right, so Absolutely. the district has a high concentration of NYCHA housing. And, you know, the mayor's budget does not address the percentage of the, of the housing stock that we have, which is NYCHA. And as a city council member, I will make sure that we focus on that because, well, as I said before, it's about the resources and what the priorities are. And NYCHA should be a priority. And I believe that, you know, the budget does not do enough. You know, the, the people are working, the maintenance people are working, but they can only work with what resources the administration gives them. So that's something that would be a priority for me as well. Mr. Russell? The, the NYCHA and every other city agency has to be accountable for what they do. The monies that they get, the way they use the resources, they must be held accountable because the problems that they have, and I know people, my cousins, I have family live in NYCHA, I have family that works for NYCHA, I have families that work in the maintenance department of NYCHA, and what they will tell you is that they don't have the resources necessary to do the work that needs to be done. They know what needs to be done. When you go down into the basements and you see water bugs this big everywhere, mice running around, they don't have the resources. Sometimes they're afraid to go down. So we need to make sure that the resources that they get, they are using them in the right way. And wherever the chips may fall, so be it. But they have to be held accountable because our people need to work. Ms. So Otero, you get the final word. Yes, they have to be held accountable. And as city council member, I would hold them accountable, but I would also be a partner. It, the, for the last 10 years, uh, my predecessor, our predecessor, worked on working with the administration, working with the authority to see how, you know, where they don't have the funding and they don't have the resources, we can provide those resources. And, and there was the, the, there were so many cameras that were installed, mm -hmm. so many other projects, mm -hmm. and there's, there just needs more to be done. It's not a quick remedy. Um, you know, even, even funding is not a quick remedy because it takes some time to get that funding into those developments. But it's a conversation that needs to happen and has to continue to happen. Okay, we're just about to take a break. I'm going to ask a one-word uh, question that requires a one-word answer. We'll go right down the line. Who do you support for president? Hillary Clinton. Bernie Sanders. Hillary. Hillary Clinton. 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 Here you go. We'll take a break. It's the uh, debate for the 17th City Council District on Bronx Talk. We'll be right back. Bronx sites. There is a special election for the city council seat in District 17 taking place on February 23rd. If you live in the neighborhoods of Bronx River, West Farms, Cortona Park East, East Tremont, Melrose, Mott Haven, Hunts Point, Morrisania, Longwood, or Soundview, you have the opportunity to learn about the candidates and issues in your community on your channel's Bronx Net and vote. Watch Bronx Talk for an informative Council District 17 debate televised all week beginning Monday, February 15th at 9 p.m. and New York City Votes Video Voter Guide at 8.30 p.m. 
on BronxNet, Optimum Channel 67, BIOS Channel 33, and on www.bronxnet.tv. You can also follow along on social media using the hashtag CD17. Stay informed, and most importantly, make sure you head out to the polls on February 23rd to make your voice heard. Welcome, everybody. We are open. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS. You can catch me on there each and every night right after the quiet storm. You can catch me right here on open, 10 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and 10 o'clock. Let's just call it on the tens and then just keep it tuned. And we got you covered like a blanket, okay? I'm out in the community and we're all over the place because we are now open. <laughs> Hello, good people of the Bronx and beyond. Welcome to A Life in Art. City Council District debate on Bronx Talk. Uh, before we get back to questions, one real quick lightning round. We'll start at the end. What's your favorite sport and favorite professional team? Baseball. And favorite team? No favorite team. Favorite team, Yankees. Basketball. Um, I, I'm a home team guy, Knicks. <laughs> uh, well, I'm from Honduras, so I love soccer, but the Yankees is my team. <laughs> Yankees. So baseball. that would be baseball, right? Baseball. <laughs> baseball fan, but I'm one of those rare ones. I like both Yankees and Mets, two different divisions, two different leagues. I knew you were going to say I'm that. a New Yorker, yeah. man. I'm a New Yorker. So, uh, and Mr. Salomon. Gary, we're Facebook friends, you know. Uh, I'm a Yankee fan. Uh, you know that. <laughs> um, Ms. Otero, we'll start with you. Okay. Mayor de Blasio has come under fire for not properly addressing the immense homelessness problem in our city. This has affected the 17th Council District in numerous ways. Number one, with the mere presence of homeless people, and two, with the burden of homeless facilities, as underscored by the Council Speaker's call for fair share reform in her state of the speech just the other day. It's nice to just say no more shelters in our neighborhood, but this is a much more complex problem than that. If elected, what would you recommend the city do to fight homelessness? A couple of things. Uh, first, what's creating the homeless um, problem in New York City, again, is the AMI. Uh, and the AMI that's being introduced by the mayor's plan is going to continue to perpetrate more homelessness. Um, there was a number that was given to me the other day by a friend that there are 14,000 homeless children in New York City, 8% of that in, the, in our borough of the Bronx. So uh, when we think about homelessness, we also only think about people in shelters. There's another homeless population, people who are living in each other's homes, um, grandparents sleeping on sofas, um, and people uh, just not, not having a, anywhere to go because when they, when they go to try to qualify for any type of uh, services, even in the, in, the, in, the whole, in DHS, they're told, no, you have a place to go, and there's a back and forth. So I would propose to continue to work with the administration to reform stuff like that, that, you know, a, a person is homeless, but then they can't even access the services. Kaylin, we'll ask you to shorten your answers because time is short. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah, just a couple of issues. A, um, mental illness is a major problem with homelessness. A lot of homeless people are, have mental illnesses that are not being addressed. The other problem that's personal to me that I know of is that even in the shelters that they have, that um, a mom, one of the members of my family was in a shelter and got a job, worked nights. And because he worked nights, there was no place for him to go during the day at a shelter. So that's a problem that we're not even addressing because now he's literally living someplace else because he can't stay in the shelter. Mr. Molina? So, it, you know, it's, it's sure a... everybody's going to want to comment. It's, so it's, an issue, it's, it's an issue of affordability. Um, and when you have the chronic person who has the mental issues, the substance abuse issue, um, you need to fund social services so that those folks don't fall through the cracks. So it's, again, about the resources, and the priority should be not only on the, on the housing, but supportive services so that these people don't, don't have a relapse, whether it's a mental issue or a substance abuse issue, where they fall back into the homeless population. Mr. Alvarez? Well, look, we have to, we have to really 
think carefully about this. This is not just about the AMI. I mean, we're talking about here a major issue with the people that live on the shelter that are homeless because they cannot qualify for the free or affordable housing. I mean, do you remember on late on the 17th when the landlords and the business and the building owners start uh, fighting their own buildings just to get the money from the insurance? Just wondering, it made me wondering, it is not the same thing because shelters right now and those affordable housing that we think are affordable for the people that live in the community, are they real affordable? The shelters, are they real shelters? Or is it a business? Mr. Bubba? Yeah, I think that the last part which you mentioned, I think is that's the bottom line. It's a business. And we need to start looking at just the issue, but we need to look at who's making the money. When you have people that they're paying $4,000 for a family to be in a homeless shelter, and it, all they need is just a down payment and a deposit to get an apartment that they're willing to pay because they're working to be able to get into an apartment, but the system will not give them that deposit. And you can't go to welfare because they're already making it, they're making beyond the threshold. That's a problem. So we need to look at beyond that. We need to look at the administrative aspects of how the homeless uh, services is working because it's basically a profit-driven motive for people to make money off the poor. And that's why we need outsiders to come in there and revamp that whole system. Mr. Solomon. Yeah, it, it is unfortunate that we have individuals who are actually working for the city of New York and they go home and they're living in a shelter. Um, you know, I am a strong uh, proponent to raising the minimum wage, you know, raise it to $15 an hour throughout the entire state, city, and state of New York. Um, as a city council member, I too will hold the providers who run these shelters accountable. Uh, one of the issues is what services are you providing to these families that are there so that when you do, the goal of these providers is to get them into permanent housing. Mm -hmm. The issue is what services are you providing so that they can stay in permanent housing and do not return back into the shelter. Um, we're just going to go, I'm not going to give you a chance to uh, respond because we're almost out of time. Uh, two sentences from each on this uh, question. Um, Mr. Russell, you'll start. The problem of gangs is suffocating many Bronx neighborhoods. How do we deal with it? Two we sentences We deal with it for neighborhood each. by neighborhood because they're not prolific gangs. It's all over the place. One neighborhood at a time, individually, and so that we can deal with it that way. Mr. Mayor? There's some violent gang members that try to control the drug trafficking. And then there's some young people who don't know better than to get involved. So I would suggest that we, you know, beef up the programs that are trying to keep the young kids from getting involved in the first place. And, you know, if you're a hardened criminal that you're terrorizing uh, your, your NYCHA or your community, then those folks need to be arrested. Mr. Alvarez? Opportunity. We need to give opportunity to those youth who live within the district. That's the key. Education and opportunity. Nobody bore band of delinquent. It's a matter of opportunity. Let's give them that. Mr. Pabon. Yeah, I think we have a fundamental problem. Again, when you have more security personnel and police officers in a school than guidance counselors, that's a major problem. When you have a situation where young people don't have a place to go to, where when I was a teenager, I was able to go to school after, five after 3 o'clock. Oh, there's no programs for these kids, so you don't have an opportunity for them to go after school, and at the same time, what are you going to do? There's no guidance counselors. I think what's key here is we, youth development. We need to find places for the teens that are after school programs where they can go um, pick up a trade or maybe, maybe even tutor some youth and, and at the same time play some basketball, some entertainment and get a stipend. I think that's what's needed. They're in the street because they're having a hard time and, and, and they're looking, they're in the wrong crowd. Uh, Ms. Otero. I think investing in gang awareness programming in schools and even before just getting to our children, even bec before they become teenagers, so that you know that they can have some skills um, when they become teenagers to confront those issues of peer pressure to enter into a gang. Okay, we are uh, at the point of our program where we will do closing statements. Uh, you each have one minute to do so. I will give you a 15-second warning at the end. Uh, Mr. Salamanca, by prior agreement, you go first. All right, thank you. Uh, well, you know, I, as a resident that's born and raised in this community and, ra you know, and raising his family here, I am humbled uh, to have the opportunity to run uh, for city council for the 17th Council District. Uh, during my time as district manager and president of the 4-1 Precinct Council, I have brought true results in terms of shutting down strip clubs, bringing in a new bus line, in terms of the 4-1 Precinct Council, uh, working, with working in pr on improving community and police relations. Uh, as your city council member, I will go to City Hall and be that advocate, build relationships, and ensure that we get our fair share of city services. Thank you very much. Mr. Bubba. Uh, I have been an activist since I was 16 years old. I came to this country at the age of four from extreme poverty, 
gone through public schools and raised my children, seven grandchildren, and I still live in the district. I believe that what we need is someone with a new voice, different voice, bring in new ideas who's not part of this whole organization but can work with them because I've done a lot more but at the same time I've never worked for a government agency with the, which was paying me the stuff that we've been doing recently to be able to help the community. So if I've been able to do things without getting paid just as an activist, can you imagine my office is not to occupy a position, my office is a tool to organize our district. Mr. Alvarez? Well, uh, my name is George Alvarez and I'm asking for your support. I've, I'm being an individual within the district. I've been through a lot of challenge, but I think that with a good education and opportunity, everything can be done. You need a real person, a real individual that, that tr struggling the same way that you are struggling right now. This season is being failing for so, so many years. So the question is, don't keep believing on the same system. You need someone who can fight for you, someone who can make your voice be heard. And as a city council member, I'm gonna assure you that that is what is going to be done. The question is, ¿van a seguir creyendo ustedes en el mismo sistema que ha fallado por tantos años? Denme la oportunidad y verán que nosotros no le vamos a fallar. Nosotros sabemos cómo hacemos las cosas. Le hemos hecho todo el tiempo en nuestros seconds. negocios. OK. <laughs> Bad timing on my part. Uh, Mr. Molina. Um, well, all I can tell you is that I've been working for the past two decades to help bring resources <coughs> to the community. I will go back as far as when Giuliani was mayor and we used to um, do demonstrations because he was spending all the asset forfeiture money, the money that's collected from um, property or bad drug deals that is confiscated was supposed to come back to the community and it was being used for other things. So I know how to um, work with the administration, I know how to hold them accountable and this is an experience that I hope to bring to the city council. Um, you know, I've been living in the Bronx for the past um, 34 years and I understand the issues I understand overcrowding you know when I first came to the United States there were four of us four brothers in one bedroom so I do understand overcrowding and I know I understand the challenges that families face when they're trying to put food on the table when they're trying to pay for their rent seconds. and what I hope to do as your city council representative is to take all of that experience all of that understanding so that I can be a advocate for your needs and deliver for you thank you Reverend Russell I'm a native New Yorker, never moved out, um, had the opportunity to do so many times, decided that I would invest and buy a house in this community, which I did. My wife and I live there. We've been living in the same house now for 23 years. I'm the president of the Homeowners Association. I am a clergy liaison for the 42nd Precinct. I do a lot for the community. I've been doing it. I'm an associate minister at two churches. I do what I have to do. I do what needs to be done to make the community what it needs to be. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. And I'm going to work with this community, whether I'm in that seat or not, to make sure that this community gets everything that they need so that the people in this community can thrive and be who they're supposed to be and get all of the resources that they can possibly get because they deserve it. These are great people. I've grown up in this neighborhood. I know it well. 15 seconds. And I'm, I, I, all I want to say to all of you is that if I am elected as your city council person, I will represent you with integrity and I will get you the services that you deserve. Ms. Otero. Born and raised in District 17, and I've worked and in my entire professional life uh, in the 17 Council District. For the last 11 years, I've served uh, the community as Chief of Staff for Council Member Maria del Carmen Arroyo. There are only 14 women left in the City Council, and I just have to touch upon the gender inequality that's um, in not just in the City Council, but throughout government. Next year, um, that number 14 is going to go down to six and women are so underrepresented. As a woman, I will look to represent this community the same way that I've represented this community for the last 11 years. I love my community. I'm there to stay. Um, I know the issues of that community because I've struggled in that community my entire life, raising my family there, now taking seconds. care of my parents. Education is important to me. Housing is important to me, but community is important to me. I love my community, please vote for me because I know that I can deliver and I can be as passionate than any, more passionate than Time. anyone could be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Candidates, uh, I, I think you have exemplified the best of the Bronx, the best of this 17th Council District. I want to thank you for your participation tonight. While you might not agree on all of the issues, I know you all agree that everyone should come out to vote on February 23rd. We also want to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the League of Women Voters. Their support is very important to the democratic process 
and we are very proud to have them with us tonight. Some of them came to attend the program, and we appreciate that. For more information, you can visit www.lwvnyc.org or call them at 212-725-3541. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for watching the program. We again encourage you to please go out and vo vote. Thanks to our producer, Jayla Jubetis, our director, Shirley Arietta, to Michael Maxnabi and Marissa White, who worked very hard to make this happen. Uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, all of their uh, great efforts, all the cast of thousands around us. Be sure to vote on the 23rd. Next week, our guest will be the borough president, Ruben Diaz, Jr. Good night. special election for the city council seat in District 17 taking place on February 23rd. If you live in the neighborhoods of Bronx River, West Farms, Cortona Park East, East Tremont, Melrose, Mott Haven, Hunts Point, Morrisania, Longwood, or Soundview, you have the opportunity to learn about the candidates and issues in your community on your channel's Bronx Net and vote. Watch Bronx Talk for an informative Council District 17 debate televised all week beginning Monday, February 15th at 9 p.m. And New York City Votes Video Voter Guide at 8.30 p.m. On Bronx Net, Optimum Channel 67, Fios Channel 33, and on www.bronxnet.tv. You can also follow along on social media using the hashtag CD17. Stay informed. And most importantly, make sure you head out to the polls on February 23rd to make your voice heard. What's on your mind? Let them know. What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Hey, I'm Darren Hyman. I want to invite you to share with me on Perspectives with yours truly. Guess what? What do we do? We share perspectives. We find out about stuff with politics, news, current events, and the things that really make a difference in your life. Perspectives with yours truly, Darren Hyde. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he lost it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. If you want to stay in the know about the latest happenings in Espanol, check out Dialogo Abierto, Bronxnet's own Spanish show, Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. on Channel 67. The latest in news, arts, culture, politics, and what's going on in your neighborhood. Dialogo Abierto, the best way to stay connected in Spanish. See you there. Te esperamos. Hello, good people of the Bronx and beyond. Welcome to A Life in Art. It's a short drive from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org.